Hello everyone, my name is Nick Fotinos. I'm formerly the cellist of 8th Blackbird. I'm a founding member of that group and was with them for 24 years. And recently I was just appointed to teach at Longi uh, School of Music of Bard Conservatory. And I'm really happy to be here today to um, walk through a little bit of how I work with electronics. Now, I want to be the first to say that I'm no expert <laughs> uh, at working with electronics. It's something that I've developed over, the, over time um, in my private uh, recital work and that sort of a thing. Um, I just found that I was doing more and more pieces that required technology and I would just do them as a one-off and ask a lot of help from friends. I still ask for a lot of help from friends to do that, um, but it was getting to be past time to really learn more about how to work with electronics to gear up in some ways. Um, and that's still a process that I'm doing, um, but I have found some things that work for me. And I kind of want to just talk through um, some of the things that I use and some of the ways that I do things to make some of the music that I do in the hopes that it helps you make your music as well. So I think a great place to start um, is to start with microphones and pickups. And this is maybe the most expensive part of my whole setup. This is a DPA 4099. And you will see this a lot on a lot of professional string players. And um, it was really Todd Reynolds and others as well that kind of hit me to this microphone. Um, for one thing, it's very small. And um, this, I actually undermount this. A lot of people overmount this and um, shoot the bridge, meaning aim the mic toward the bridge. I found I was hitting the mic all the time. And while that was a great mic placement, it wasn't a great <laughs> placement for me making sound on my instrument. So you can actually undermount this as well. And I just have it aiming toward um, the C string side of my instrument. You can, you sh I highly recommend with all of these things, exploring what works best for you. This was a process for me of ex exploration. Um, so those usually run about $600, but, um, which is a lot, 600 US dollars, and that's a lot, but it's also one of those things that you buy it once, and it's good for a long, long time as long as you take care of it. So it's really worth it. Um, why it's so great, um, it's really great for live sound situations. Um, so for me, you know, wanting to perform live, like I knew this was kind of the mic that it kind of had to be. There's not a whole lot of, I mean, there are some other choices. This kind of blows it out of the water. Um, the other thing I have hooked up today right now is, um, and it's really hard to see, but you can kind of see under my bridge, there's a little piece of cork that's kind of stuck to the bridge. And that is um, connected to um, a pickup. And for those of you that might not know, um, the main difference between a mic and a pickup is a microphone is actually recording live sound. It's recording those vibrations in air. What a pickup does is record those vibrations directly. So it's not actually recording any sound. It's just picking up the vibrations through the instrument. If you've ever seen an electric guitar or an electric bass, it's the same thing. Those are pickups. Um, it's not because they don't produce that much sound. Uh, <laughs> acoustic sound on their own. So this is a Schertler um, system that actually comes also with its own uh, little pre, um, preamp box, which is great. And I actually found this um, on the site Reverb.com, which I highly recommend to everybody. They have a lot of new and used um, gear. They have um, recommendations. Um, it's just kind of a fantastic place. And you can, I bought this for about half of what it usually costs. It usually retails around 500. I think I got it for like 225. So highly recommend reverb.com. I do not get paid by them. Uh, so, and that's basically the beginnings of how I transfer sound to um, my computer. And, but there's still an another couple of steps before we get there. I'm gonna turn the mic a little bit so you can see my computer and my lovely coffee mug, which I'm gonna drink from right now. So, um, this is a Motu Microbook 2C. 
And um, what this allows, this allows for um, one microphone um, SLR, XLR input, um, one guitar input, um, and actually I think two other inputs as well and has four outputs. But the size factor when you're traveling is amazing. This is um, a great little unit and not that expensive. Um, usually retails around 250 bucks. I also recommend for those on a budget, a Focusrite. Um, they make, um, I know a lot of people use these right now. And so what um, all, all of these do is really just converting signals, um, whether, you know, from those vibrations into zeros and ones that your computer can understand. That's really the main purpose of that. And it has um, much better um, hardware and software inside it to do that than your computer does. So this is kind of the why sometimes people find a difference between like USB microphones <clears throat> and actually wired microphones that are going through an audio interface because the audio interface just has better hardware to convert those signals. Um, and usually wired microphones tend to be of a higher level, though USB microphones have come a long, long way. I will say I also use sometimes a USB microphone in my... Um, extensive Zoom work, which we're all doing these days. Um, this is this is actually made in Australia, and um, this is a pod, a Rode Podcaster, really really fantastic sounding mic, um, USB, plug and play, very easy to use, and great sound. Um, since I have it within arm's reach, I don't use that for recording myself. When I record myself at home, I use this guy. This is an AT twenty twenty, which is also on the low end. I'm working on gearing up for recording at home as well. But this is kind of an all-purpose mic. You can put this in front of almost anything. It sounds great. But this is not, obviously this is, and right now it has, um, this has a, a, a wind guard on it right now. Um, so, but uh, this obviously is kind of large for <laughs> taking on the road versus this little guy that fits directly on your instrument. So if you put your instrument down, no matter if you move a lot, which I do sometimes when I play, this has the DPA 4099 has you covered. Um, this will record more sound. This is a much more directional mic, whereas this will record, even though it's a front address microphone, it's still gonna pick up a lot of other things. So this is great for home recording. This actually works fairly well for home recording, but this is kind of more meant for live performance. So. Uh, make sure when you, if you're looking at mics and you want to perform live, that you kind of have that in mind. Right now, my main thing that I use is Ableton Live. And this is the choice of a lot of DJs worldwide, but also increasingly a lot of performers that perform live music um, with uh, pre-recorded or electronic sounds. Because there's so much that you can do with it um, on the fly to manipulate sound. What I love about it is there's a lot of things that you can automate. And um, first I want to show you what um, QMix looks like. It looks like this. And so basically every time, uh, what this does, you can use this to monitor the levels of your instrument. And you can um, focus on the specific one. So if I focus here, um, this is the microphone input. That looks like that and this is the guitar input so you can see the guitar inputs a little bit hotter and it is you can see with this trim number um, what that is is the amount of gain that you have in it so let's just dial that back so it looks a little bit similar to what we have um, on the other one um, you'll see line one and two that's also an input on the back um, that we're not using right now so, um, within that, you can also mix between the two instruments. Um, and we don't really need to mess around with uh, this right now so much, basically because we're just using this as a pass-through to the computer. Um, so we're gonna have Ableton tell us what we wanna hear, but it is important to turn this off because um, otherwise we might get monitoring to both um, both Ableton and the microbook at the same time, which means you're kind of double monitoring, which is bad. So, and then you can also monitor the outputs too. And that will be, 
that also, we don't have to worry too much about that, but it's good to set initial levels. It's kind of one of those like set it and forget it sort of things. All right, so this um, is Ableton, and I have this um, set up to um, what I, the piece I'm about to play, which is um, Natalie Joachim's Dom Wen Yo. This is a fairly straight ahead piece, um, but I do want to walk through some things within Ableton. Um, so this right now that we're looking at, um, there's two different views in Ableton that you can always work with, which is arrangement view or session view. And so I mostly work um, a lot of times in session, uh, sorry, arrangement view. Um, and so you'll see the different tracks that I'm playing with. Now the top one is the live cello input. And you see, even when I play a little bit, that'll come right through. Um, that's, I just have that coming in from uh, number one input, which is the microphone input. Um, the, this is the track activator. That's the volume that I can also adjust here, mostly to turn it down. It has a little bit of headroom to bump it up as well. Um, if I turn this off, you'll see it's still monitoring it, but it won't, you won't actually see it versus there. Then that's how you know that it's on. Same thing if I do this, that'll be grayed out. That means it's not going to play. And that's a just easy way to turn on and off um, what you're doing. So that's the live cello. You'll see this is click, and you'll see this has no input. Um, what I do, because I'm kind of nerdy, is um, rather than, Ableton does have a click and a metronome um, function. Um, I like to kind of craft my own because, uh, especially in this piece, um, there's a place where it goes into seven, eight. And maybe because of the tempo, like I don't want to hear every single eighth note or I want to hear some things. The other reason I do this also is so that um, at the end, I can just have it end. And so I don't have to worry about turning on the metronome before I start playing the piece. Um, it just automatically goes by itself. So again, it's one of those things, it's not even what I'm talking about in terms of automation. Um, it's not a very fancy thing, but it's something that I find really useful to do. Um, under that, you'll find the Domino track itself. And, um, oh, one other thing I should mention about the metronome is that uh, if I expand this a little bit, um, you'll see you can input at the very beginning um, what tempo, or sorry, what meter you want to be in, and you can edit time signature right there. That's what I do. For this piece, is relatively simple, but there are a few. Um, there's a change to 7.8 there. Later on, there's a change to 7.4. And so you can kind of see how that changes um, from 4.4 4 to 7.8, even visually um, later on, uh, which is about here. Yeah, it changes to 7.4. So that's just how I kind of input that. And you can, um, by clicking that on, en on the beginning of any measure, even in the middle of measures, you can change um, what meter you're in. Um, so I can create click tracks for anything. I can also even slow them down or speed them up while they're going. Um, I'll, I won't dive into that, but right now, but it's incredibly useful just for making click tracks. Um, and basically, I, you can just go in within Ableton and steal uh, their metronome sounds and just use them as sounds and kind of just drop them in uh, where you want them. All right, so um, let me zoom back out here. So under that, in the third track, uh, we have the backing track, the final mix. Um, so this is what I received from the composer. And um, that pretty much always just plays two. Sometimes I might need to adjust um, how much uh, gain it has, depending on where I'm playing or what it sounds like um, in the room. And I can do that quite easily directly from here without having to twiddle any knobs or anything. Um, directly under that is an old recording that I had, which looks very different. <laughs> um, so that is also useful. And then directly under that, I have a cello comp. And this is just a recording of me playing the piece. Now, why is that useful? Um, it's incredibly useful because I can have this play with the track and when I'm in a live situation, I can go out in the hall and hear relatively accurately how it's going to sound when I play. What I'm not going to hear is my own acoustic sound, 
but I will get a sense of what the balance is with the electronics coming out into the house. And so this is incredibly useful, um, especially in situations where uh, you might not have a whole lot of assistance or uh, an audio person that's um, there the whole time or there as much as you'd like. Um, <laughs> so that's been incredibly useful. I highly recommend with any kind of piece like this, um, recording uh, yourself doing the whole piece doesn't matter the accuracy. It's really, it's never meant to be heard by anyone else other than you, really for the purposes of getting a balance in the house that you can hear yourself. So um, other than that, um, maybe we'll switch views into session view. So this is just a different way of looking at the same information. You're not going to see the uh, the actual audio files, but you will see a lot more controls about where to send things. So um, so these are the five um, tracks that we just talked about. And really, live cello is the only one that um, we have anything coming in on. Everything else, there's no input. Um, so they're just playback tracks, um, and they're not even all activated. The old recording and the cello comp is not activated for performance, obviously. Um, if we go over on the right side here, um, there are, there's one for headphones, and I should mention all of these, you can rename to anything you want. Um, and it's, I think at first it's really just reverb and something else that I can't remember. Um, so what I did here, this is just a mix for my headphones and I can adjust depending, uh, on the situation. I can adjust how much of myself I want to hear, how much of the backing track, how much of the click. Um, usually I want to hear quite a lot of click. Um, so I, and then I can also tell it where to send it. And right now I'm sending it to just to eight. And what that is, is on the microbook, that's just, just the right side of the headphone input. And so usually when I perform, I'm just performing with one, um, one earphone in my right ear and then my left ear is free so I can hear the cello acoustically. So generally when I'm playing, I really just like to have obviously a click if I'm playing with click and then maybe a little bit of the backing track, but just for tuning. But other than that, um, I really just like to hear myself uh, play through. Um, and so this is also to master, uh, which is the master like going out into the house. And again, I can adjust the levels if I need to. Need to. Um, so that's that can also be useful in certain situations. Um, I can also, it looks like right now I have two different routings for headphone and the master to do a cue out. Um, and the cue out is really just for um, uh, the metronome within Ableton, which is up here. So uh, you don't have to worry about that too much. But this is basically where you monitor um, what you're sending out. This uh, master volume slider is really important and um, <laughs> it's picking up me talking right now uh, very quietly from my cello. Um, this little button, which you can barely see, is just a limiter. Um, so you can um, make sure that you're not clipping, that you're not getting into the red when you perform. Um, so that's also very useful too. Um, so there's just a couple places that I know I went through this very quickly. Um, and there's a lot I didn't cover about, you know, different sounds and instruments and audio effects and all these things. This piece is particularly, um, is relatively easy. It's pretty much just I play. There's no actual processing of my sound. If there was, um, I might be using certain things. Um, I sometimes put, you'll see, these are my favorites. Um, and here you see I have the metronome up and down sound. Um, I have some EQs that I use on almost everything. Um, I have some reverb, concert hall reverb, um, that I adjust. Um, I also have compression sometimes, so that soft sounds, mostly for soft sounds that d don't end up sounding too soft. Um, but there's so many different audio effects, um, as you'll see here, like delays and looping, um, reverb, of course, um, and almost anything you can think of, and there's more things out in the world for you to even buy. And so depending on the piece, there might be certain ways that I'm processing my sound to make it sound like an electric guitar or just to make it sound totally wacky. Um, so there's really, really so much you can do. And one of the things I love as a performer um, with doing all of these things is rather than having a full pedal board, 
I can automate a lot of these things um, within like classical pieces so that like when that's supposed to appear in the piece, I don't have to do anything in the moment. It's already doing it itself. Um, so it's really huge. Um, and it also doesn't require me like traveling with a ton of gear, which is <laughs> also huge. So that's, um, that is the tiniest ever slice of a crash course into Ableton. And I think now I'd like to play for you uh, Natalie Joachim's Dom Wenyo. Yeah, <laughs> 